I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by award-winning science fiction author and space scientist, Dr. David Brin. In addition to writing dozens of best-selling novels and short stories, some of which have been adapted for film and television, David is a 2010 Fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Immersion Technologies, helped establish the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, serves on the advisory board of NASA's Innovation and Advanced Concepts Group, and does futurism consulting for diverse organizations, including the U.S. Department of Defense, Procter & Gamble, SAP, Google, and many more. David is the winner of numerous awards and honors, including the prestigious Nebula, Hugo, and Locus Awards for science fiction, and holds a PhD in space science from the University of California. So David, welcome back, sir. Since our last interview, a couple of years back in 2020, you have been incredibly busy. There's the, the publication of the best of David Brin, Vivid Tomorrows, Colony High, Castaways of New Mojave, along with new additions of several of your older classics hitting bookstands. Can you give me an update on, on where your writing is at right now? Well, uh, it depends on how you look at things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting on in years and I really need to write the big science fiction novels that actually civilization wants from me. All the other things you mentioned, uh, I, I can feel both civilization and my wife patting me on the head and say, okay, you're having fun, you know, doing all these other things and maybe there is some value. <clears throat> but a hundred years from now, all that people will remember of you is the books. So the that best of, which just came out, is kind of kind of cool. It's, you know, but also kind of daunting because it implies that my best is behind me, but it's got a great uh, Patrick Farley cover and it's uh, a limited edition um, of my best short fiction. And short fiction is very, very different than the novella length, which is very different than the novel. Uh, the best storyteller I ever knew, Paul Anderson, got all of his awards for novelettes and novellas, mm -hmm. the middle length. And I finally realized why it was because he was a natural tribal storyteller ah, and the okay. natural storytelling length is the novella because that's what the storyteller would have told the tribe over a campfire. Okay. You like that story. Now Og say, go to sleep. Uh, so the Transparent Society, my um, nonfiction book about freedom and privacy, still sells after 20 years because nothing is obsolete. <laughs> it's all pertinent. But yeah, you mentioned Vivid Tomorrows, and that's um, that's my nonfiction book that just came out from McFarland, the number two um, nonfiction publisher in America. And it's about uh, science fiction in Hollywood and how um, it's very likely <clears throat> that none of us would be alive right now if it weren't for Hollywood sci-fi. Mm, okay. And the self-preventing prophecies that pour from science fiction. Uh, Soil and Green recruited millions of environmentalists, and we might squeak by because of that. Um, the China Syndrome, all the virus movies that got people just paranoid enough so that we got those vaccines. Um, and of course, you know, the, the most important was Dr. Strangelove, Fail Safe on the Beach, War Games, yes. Yes. War Deputy Testament, all warned of different ways that nuclear war might happen by accident. Um, and of course, <clears throat> the granddaddy was George Orwell's 1984. As a matter of fact, some of our current problems are because almost all Americans have a paranoid fear of Big Brother. The difference between an average Republican and an average Democrat is which direction they think Big Brother's trying to scheme from. A decent American conservative is concerned about uh, snooty academics and faceless government bureaucrats becoming Big Brother. A decent American liberal is afraid of um, uh, conniving aristocrats and oligarchs and foreign tyrants and uh, faceless corporations. 
to when you express it that way, the answer is, well, duh, they're all potential tyrants and they all should be looked at. And the tragedy of the destruction of American political discourse in the last 20 years is that we are no longer willing to say to the people on the other side, okay, this is my obsession. I'm obsessed with those damn you know, bureaucrats. But I admit that the oligarchs on my side could be dangerous. So you guard my back, I'll guard yours. Mm, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. Well, that's not happening now. It, it, that that has been the principal aim of those oligarchs is to destroy the synergy upon which our enlightenment and democracy was based. But that was a little rant there. Another book that just came out is my wife's first novel, Melody of Memory. Oh, wonderful. A wonderful. better, a better wonderful. book than any of mine with the best opening line. Uh, it's a it's science fiction, but very sweet, very feminine. Nobody's nobody's going to accuse her me of having ghostwritten this. But it has the best opening line. I'll see if I can recite it from memory. I was nine the year my words saved a man's life. It wasn't until later that my words killed him. Mm. And there it begins. There it begins. <laughs> Okay, so you asked a question. That's only some of the things. That yeah, I that that's engaged. just a few. Again, you've been incredibly busy. You sent over some materials before the interview, and I went through those. And as I started doing research, I was just shocked. I was like, oh, my God, there is so much material going on right now in your life. So well, yesterday I did a Zoom um, class on human augmentation for the Australian Defense Department. I give those twice a year. Uh, and sometimes I go up to the uh, Naval Postgraduate School here in California at Monterey to talk about the future. Um, this last couple of years with COVID, uh, the first time in uh, about six or seven years, I haven't spoken at CIA. And you know, it's frustrating because when you do a novel not only do I get paid better and I, you know, get more pats on the head, but I can see something. Uh, I have no idea what these people do, except that they invite me back. So I guess there must be something. But, oh, man, I could rant about these wars and stuff going on right now. But they they ask me to rant once a year about farther future stuff. They don't well, want you know, and on that note, actually, it's further down on my questions list, but I do have some rants about the worst. But, you know, I so I did want to I did want to ask it, last time we talked, we were in the middle of a global pandemic and and I, at least, was busy stockpiling masks and toilet paper, apparently, along with the rest of the people in my area. So oh, it, could you use some masks? I got some boxes. Oh, yes. And I, I still have toilet paper. I still have tons of it, you know. Um, so it seems like we're on the other side of things now. So I'm wondering, what are some of your thoughts on the pandemic as a whole? And are there any lessons that we can take away from this experience? Oh, well, there's one just gigantic piece of good news. And that is anybody who was planning biowarfare uh, and there are labs uh, northeast of the Himalayas and north of the Himalayas and places that we can't get spies into that are undoubtedly working on such things. Mm. Um, the uh, This net effect of COVID has been to prove how far science has come, largely because of those science fictional warnings. Let's not forget that it wasn't a standard vaccine that came in six months, just six months after this thing hit. It was the new type. It was the RNA um, uh, vaccines that had looked like they were science fictional and then the future. And the FDA was dragging its feet saying, no, 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 this is a brand new thing. But an emergency made them let go. And we had these things within six months. And undoubtedly, the tools for making them are much, much better now. And I think that that is a deterrence, that has been a deterrence to anybody thinking about biowarfare. And it's my job to think about such things. Yeah. 
Now, yeah. people like, accuse me of being this cloud cuckoo optimist because I think there's a 40% chance that you, Tim, probably not me, but you or maybe our kids will live to see an actually glowing, shining, not from nuclear explosions, um, a future. Uh, because um, so many tools are coming together. Uh, but that's 40%. The odds have always been against this great enlightenment experiment. I mean, look what happened if you read Thucydides, read Pericles' funeral oration. Uh, Periclean Athens was so much vastly more creative, productive, fecund, uh, dynamic than all of the kingdoms around them combined, including horrible, stupid, overrated Sparta. Uh, and it was only because this diamond-shaped structure of a middle class um, democracy is creative, but it's unstable. Mm, so its okay. enemies are able to take advantage of how of spurring divisiveness within it, and that's how Athens fell, uh, Da Vinci's Florence. The few experiments in this alternative uh, way of running things, where six thousand years the 99% of our ancestors lived under these pyramids of thuggish feudalist authority enforced by brutal men with swords who would take other men's women and wheat. And that was their top priority to make sure that their, inherit, their brats inherited everything, um, including, including other people's children. We're all descended from the harems of those guys. And that explains male fantasies. Uh, tell, that, tell that to your wives. So this enlightenment experiment is dynamic, creative, spectacular, but it is not as stable as this pyramid was. Yeah, as a, as a form of governance. And every generation of this spectacular, successful, most recent experiment, 200 years, every generation has had to defend it against those who would turn it back into a pyramid of privilege. And uh, that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to maintain. It's very, very hard to maintain, and we're facing this crisis now. But I'm an optimist because I think there's a good 40% chance. I think that's why the world oligarchy is pushing so hard with such a united effort. Casino moguls and petro shakes and 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 bo uh, oil boyars and and uh, inheritance brats. Uh, all working together with their propaganda mills to uh, destroy the confidence, because I think they know time is running out for them. Yeah. And I depict this in my novel, uh, Existence, that uh, I depict meetings being held by the smarter of these um, trillionaire oligarchs in the future, just 20 years from now, trying to figure out, you know, how if they do manage to restore feudalism, how you can make it not stupid. Because the fundamental of this pyramid was stupidity. You look at the testimonies right there in front of us in this litany of horrors called history. And the reason they were stupid, even under the good kings, and there were good kings, is because the most natural habit, especially of males, is if you can shut down the criticism of others, you do. You evade criticism. And yet one of my more famous um, aphorisms is, criticism is the only known antidote to error. Hmm. You see, we humans are fundamentally delusional. I profit from it because I make, I make packaged delusions. But I'm honest about it. And I say, this is a delusion, enjoy. The problem is when you take these delusions and you believe them to a degree that evidence does not support, or you concoct evidence and claim that it's supported, 
The only way through to your delusions, well, there are two ways. One is science. And those of us who are trained in science, we learn a religious catechism uh, in, in the science monasteries. It goes, I might be wrong. Or I might be wrong. Ain't it cool? Let's find out. That's the longer sort of Catholic version. That helps us to find maybe half of our errors, an incredibly high rate. But we're still delusional. Yeah. The only way to that's ever been found to penetrate human delusions systematically is criticism because you, Tim, you don't share my delusions. You share some of them, but you can see some of mine. And so you can criticize them. <laughs> and your enemies are willing to give you this favor for free. This is where it's a gift economy. All of you out there, the criticism you need is available either from a loving spouse, and that's the best source, or from your enemies. And they'll criticize you for free. And guess what? It's a gift economy. You'll be happy to return the favor. And if you have the right attitude towards the criticism by your enemies, you'll go, hmm, I, yeah, go on, go on, ha. Huh. That's interesting. Uh, okay, point one, well, you're an idiot. Point two, you didn't get it. Point three, ah, well, I'd better fix that. And the most, the most important criticisms are often the most painful. I think you just alluded to that. Those are the ones that we don't like to admit, right? Oh, well, well there's, a, there's a very great man out there who a lot of you out there are giving a lot of crap these days but he gave us uh 15 years earlier the electric cars 15 years earlier the self-landing rockets he put up a million or more solar roofs and he's being dumped on because he doesn't have a real wife to control his his outbursts which one quite frankly admits are sometimes kind of jimpering uh out of control stuff oh <laughs> well it, now it, 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 if i could suggest i i've heard about those and jeff bezos has a few of those also and in the case of he Elon, had a wife he had a really good one <laughs> you know the, the 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 takeaway that i have from those though from both of those is they are both dot com 1.0 era uh, celebrities, executives, if you will. And and I think part of it is the mantra of that era was to go big and stay in the news. And so I've always interpreted a lot of those, the, the outbursts, as you call them, as, you know, if they don't see their name in the news, I, I, there's a part of me that wonders if they feel nervous. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I, I can see that, though I can also hear the echoes of those harems. Um, once a human male gets into a position like that, um, the temptation is to say, I don't know why I have to take this criticism. Now, the two guys you mentioned, they still get in the weeds with their engineers. Yeah. One of them gets down in the weeds and it's his favorite place. And that's why his rockets work. Um, but the point is there are all of you people out there yelling at these guys, for heaven's sake, you know, keep your eye on them. But there are a thousand billionaires out there who did not give us <laughs> any good things. They're just simply our enemies and they're, and they're working hard to destroy our freedoms and uh, this fantastic enlightenment. How will we go after them first? I mean, the ones who are um, channeling uh, money from a rising Asian nation through their Macau casinos straight into one of our political parties, hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, it, 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 you know, one of the things that, that I have read is that past a certain point in wealth, motivations tend to change from making it 
from creating change in the world towards protecting that power structure, protecting that wealth. And so I, I think that that Bezos and Musk are among a few. Bill Gates would probably be another one of of these new school innovators who are actually using that wealth to move things forward as opposed to simply, you know, trying to build a wall around it. Well, Gates, for example, is his principal focus right now is philanthropy. Um, Bezos spun off his philanthropic half, one might call it the better half. Um, but she certainly is showing that to be the case. I mean, that's one way to do it. I mean, you call that a 50% tax, a philanthropic tax. I suppose it's not exactly morally uh, something you get credit for, but on paper, it certainly is worth crediting. Um, but, you know, these guys, uh, they, they, they the, the people who are going to make the biggest difference are the science fiction readers and watchers and all of that. So let's talk about them. Let's talk to them. Over my right ear is Venus. That's a globe of Venus. There's Mars. But this right here is the coolest one of the dozen coolest pictures I ever saw, the other 11 being my daughter. Um, that is a picture of the oceans of Titan. There's a shoreline, you know, a river coming into a sea. And the sea is made of methane and ethane and hydrocarbons. And if there's life forms there, they're made of wax. We're a people who do stuff like that. We just smacked an asteroid and learned all sorts of stuff. We just unfolded an origami telescope. What can be beyond the reach of such people if we just rebuilt our confidence? I mean, uh, I, I talk a fair amount. I have a, uh, I'll give you in the chat, a riff I did at a Singularity Conference a decade ago on on theology. And you can turn things around in discussions with the people who use their biblical sources as an anchor for rejecting modernity. And, and you can talk to them because you're the smart ones, right? And you haven't read one of the fundamental touchstones of your civilization and understood how it can be argued that we're here in order to have this enlightenment and to grow. And they'll turn back at you and they'll say, the, the Tower of Babel was proof that he didn't want us to, to rise up. No, it's just evidence that he didn't want us to rise up then. I mean, if you look at the Tower of Babel story, and this is just one of the snippets from that, um, from that video I'll, I'll give you. If you look at the Tower of Babel story in the Quran and the Book of Mormon, God is angry at the hubris of humans building the tower. But if you look at the original source, if you look in Genesis, there's not one lick of anger, not a bit of anger. I mean, this is a guy who a page earlier killed almost everybody with a flood. A mm. page later, he pours down fire and brimstone and asteroids onto, onto cities of sinners. He has a temper. And he shows none of it in the in the Tower of Babel story. The phrase is, look at them. If they continue thus building the tower, nothing will be beyond them. Therefore, let us scatter them with many languages so that they can experience a great diversity of cultures. That's, that part isn't in there. But all right, so the question is, was it don't do that or don't do that yet? Because look at the phrase that almost no theologians for 3,000 years actually focused on. If they continue to us, nothing will be beyond them. Sorry about the doorbell. That was the dramatic moment and it goes and it interferes. Maybe that was heavenly. Mm -hmm. If they continue thus, nothing will be beyond them. Implicit in that is that humans were made fundamentally capable 
of having nothing beyond us. That is probably the most important moment in that entire work because it says, maybe not this time, maybe next time, because we have scattered, we have gathered our diversity. We have 10,000 languages and now we're gathering them together. We can translate anything, we can do anything. And we are picking up the tools of creation. The workroom was left open. Most of the, the truly foundational scientists have expressed some level of faith, I guess, in a higher power. Well, um, you know, I just I just had my 50th Caltech reunion. So my wife, who also got her uh, PhD there, we, we were up at Caltech last weekend. And I was hanging out with Kip Thorne, uh, the Nobel Prize winner who did the LIGO experiment discovering gravity waves. Um, and um, I sort of marginally knew Richard Feynman, and he was an atheist. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, my father told me that he took me to see Einstein play the violin when I was three. Hmm. And uh, two things. One, all the great scientists I've ever known had artistic sidelines. Okay. So this notion that uh, science is instead of art um, is a complete canard. You know, Feynman had his paintings and his painting and his bongo drums, for example, Einstein, the violin and so on. But uh, I'd have to say that probably a majority of modern scientists are um, either uh, atheists or uh, confrontational agnostics, as I am. In other words, uh, I, I'm not going to accept heaven from somebody who doesn't have a good explanation for, for human existence. There is one that I can think of that is um, could get him off the hook for all the hell we've been through. And that's an explanation that's hard for an egotist like me to admit, but it's really the only logical conclusion. And that is that I'm not important. Most religions say you, the individual, you're the important thing. That doesn't make any sense. If it's true, then the whole situation we've been suffering through for thousands of years is cruel and stupid. But he gets off the hook if the whole experiment is not about me, but about us. If it's about us, then we're like skin cells. And maybe the real being that's taking shape, the real work of art that he wanted, she wanted out of this, was a macro being that we are part of. And so our individual suffering is less important than the steps forward that our our individual suffering is part of. If that's the case, then I can go, well, okay, take me to heaven, I guess. Um, this, But you're right. As a scientist, I am very, very interested in this, even if I, uh, you know, wagering basis, I'd go 60%. There's, there's no such being out there. But again, it's a matter of odds. One of the works I put out in the last uh, couple of years is a play. Mm, and okay. it's a theological play about an escape from hell, but it's primarily a um, confrontation in three acts between a smart ass and the devil. When have you ever seen that before? It's a genre, you know, De devil and Daniel Webster. And it was interesting and, and fun, but I suppose the biggest theological speculation I made was in Earth, great big honking novel in which um, the whole notion of Gaia, Earth, uh, there's what's called the weak Gaia, um, hypothesis that planets get some degree of homeostatic synergy, you know, um, based on life. 
there's the intermediate, there's the strong Gaia, which is that the ecosystem is itself a living organism. And then there's the hyper strong Gaia, after I've talked about all those others, where she really comes alive. <laughs> so I don't mean to make a spoiler there, but you'll be surprised at how. Yeah. Well, you know, if if I could turn to another, actually another author's science fiction thing, one of the things that stuck in my head was towards the end of Inherit the Stars. In fact, I think it was maybe on the last page, James P. Hogan's Inherit the Stars. Yeah. Okay. And he had talked about the ascent of mankind. And and uh, yeah, I'm paraphrasing, I've read it a long time ago, but he talked about our ancestors, we evolved here, right? We We came up in the mud and... They fought and struggled and bled and died for millennia, right? And and if there is a higher power, that higher power may have been helping us, but that work and that credit belongs to the human race. And, and all of that has led to this moment now and those future moments for our children, you know? And, and so to, when I read that, to me, that's an incredibly powerful statement, I think. And certainly, I think that we should always have some measure of humility, but I think that we should also you know, recognize how much hard work and sacrifice has been done by our entire species just to arrive where we are now. Oh, well, you, 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 you said a real mouthful, Tim, with several implications. Um, one is that if we are getting help, it would help explain why they... Um, whoever's helping us, keeps it secret so that we will have the pride of having done it ourselves. It's one of the explanations for the Fermi paradox, It's uh, which is the great question of why we don't see signs of, of predecessors in the galaxy. Uh, there are about a hundred explanations that I've cataloged, and uh, the top one is that uh, if you look at the evolutionary record, and I talk about this in my novel Existence, um, there is no reason to believe that humans could have gotten so so smart so fast. And despite thousands, 12,000 years of this pyramids um, rewarding rapacious males, nevertheless, we're actually pr probably pretty nice. If you compare us to, compare our males to male bears, or lions, or, or elephant seals, um, <clears throat> we're actually capable, uh, a fair number of us, of being tamed to a tolerable degree. Um, and uh, so there are all sorts of reasons to believe that uh, humans may be the first to get out to the stars simply because we're the first who are somewhat capable of being a little bit reasonable and therefore yeah. using that reasonableness as we're trying right now to um, get more reasonable and get better. And, uh, you know, I, I can, can just see and hear sort of with this imagination bump actually there above the eyes Um some of your people in the audience simmering over that because I'm giving us credit, especially males, and that angers them. But I'm saying it in a way that is talking about the very improvement campaign that they're engaged in. And I approve of the improvement campaign that they're engaged in. We, ha we have to be chided into being better. So uh, I, I think some of your audience, their heads are about to explode. Tough. The thing is that 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 um, we we are quite amazing, and uh, you know uh, I think that one in science fiction this was expressed very well in uh, the original movie and the TV series um, uh, Alien Nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I urge people to dig deep, deep, deep down into their Hulu to find it because it was absolutely fabulous. The notion being that there's a, there's a revolt aboard a slave ship in, uh, in a tyrannical alien civilization and the ship comes to earth 
to the Mojave Desert in California. <laughs> and uh, the alien slaves aboard are processed by INS and they wound up wind up forming their own sort of ghetto neighborhoods in LA and San Francisco. And there's this one scene in which Mandy Patinkin, uh, as one of the aliens, says to James Kahn, we expected a better form of slavery here. What we did not expect for you to welcome us and make us citizens. Uh, and, and this miracle is so amazing to us that it's so jarring when you don't live up to that and you act like, like, like racist idiots. So it combined the chiding moving forward yeah, with a very rare thing in science fiction. And that's giving us some credit for being actually quite amazing. Although in that scene, I believe he was drinking curdled milk. So. Yes, he was drinking curdled milk and that's their alcohol. And he, and he, he doesn't like James Conn's scotch by the way james con i risk raise a glass to him he died just recently rollerball fantastic movie just wonderful movie yeah yeah well david on that note let me close for today we have explored so many large ideas thank you so much for your time today sir sure and some other time we'll get to the ya series the I I High would students. absolutely love to. I would a love to come back to those. Aliens kidnap a California high school and live to regret it. So in any event, uh, thank you for the plug session and uh, the uh, ga garrulous gab session. And I hope it was at least somewhat amusing. Absolutely wonderful, sir. Absolutely wonderful. It, it has been an honor. And thank you again for your time. Okay. Best to all of you. Hey. Stick up for civilization, huh? It's a little different, and it's where I keep my stuff. <laughs>